What a great way for us to start this week, right? Telling Jesus, thank you. Ultimately, Jesus is the reason why we give thanks to God. It is through him. So friends, we're coming to this season of Thanksgiving, and I, and I have a lot of appreciation for a bunch of different things that I wasn't appreciative of before. Right? Indy and I are talking about pacifiers and bibs. Never talked about that before, and we're, we, we, we've learned a lot of things. Pack and plays are expensive, and so are strollers. Did you know that? Well, we didn't know that. You know that there's this thing called a bassinet, and babies sleep on it? Did you know that? Well, we didn't, right? So we're coming to, we're coming to this season with, with renewed thankfulness for things that... If we had considered a year from now, we wouldn't be too thankful about because they were irrelevant for us. But when the gift meets the need, we often respond with, we ought to respond with thankfulness. Isn't that true? Hold on to that thought. So you want to know what you can give me for Christmas this year? Give me diapers, okay? <laughs> Lots of them, okay? Tons of diapers. So last year, I asked for mangoes, okay? I have no use for mangoes right now. So the word thankfulness or different variations of it appear in the, in the short letter to the Colossians seven times, seven ch times in four chapters. And on the passage that we're going to study today, the word thankfulness appears three times in three verses. So it is obvious that thankfulness is an important issue to the Colossians. Look at verse 16 of the passage that we're about to read. Colossians 3, your outline says Colossians 2, should say Colossians 3, verse 16 through verse 17. It says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. As a matter of fact, the verse right before this says that let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. Although we're not going to be looking at this verse, it's important for us to, to just feel the weight of that command. It, it's a commandment. Being thankful is a commandment. Paul is speaking imperatively here. But is that something we can do? Can we, can we turn a switch on and off where we are unthankful, now we're thankful? Is that how thankfulness works? We're told, be thankful, and we say, okay, my heart will obey. We try that with kids, right? We teach them, to say two things. We teach them to say please, and we teach them to say thank you, right? But kids don't always do it, right? They, they don't always obey the commandments, and sometimes when they obey, it's not from the heart. It's just lip service so that they can avoid trouble later. But it's not just children that struggle with a heart of thankfulness. Have you ever prayed for years for something, and when you received it, you forgot to say thanks, to pray in thankfulness to God? Well, I have. Friends, we struggle. It's true. We struggle to be thankful because thankfulness is not native to the fallen hearts of fallen men. We are by nature selfish and not selfless. We can't just turn the switch on and off whenever we please. 
But there is something we can do. And I think our passage is going to help us see that today. The title for this message is Cultivating Thankfulness Through Christ-Centered Worship. So friends, we can, and you can, you can fill this in your outline, we can cultivate an attitude of thankfulness as we pursue the means of grace that God makes available to us. You see, the idea here is not a switch, but the idea here is of a plant growing slowly, but consistently. So we can cultivate, we can, we can feed, we can cause to grow, we can cause an attitude of thankfulness to grow in our hearts as God gives us grace. And one of the means of grace that we're going to be talking about today is worship. We often think of worship as our worship to God, a service to God, but in many ways worship is a service to our own hearts. As we worship, we become more thankful to God. So we can gradually develop a thankful heart towards God as we seek to avail ourselves of the tools that he gives us for our sanctification. So we have a guiding question today. I have two points, okay? And we have a guiding question that's going to lead into our two points. The guiding question is this. How do we cultivate a thankful heart towards God? I think our text is going to answer that question today. My first point, I'm going to give them to you now. I'll give them to you later as well. My first point, and by far the longest, okay? So don't don't fret when I'm several minutes into this point. My second point is much shorter. But my first point is we cultivate thankfulness in our hearts towards God by worshiping Him corporately. And my second point will be we cultivate thankfulness or thankful hearts towards God by worshiping Him with our entire lives. So let's consider first we cultivate thankful hearts towards God by worshiping Him corporately. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Paul begins verse 16 telling the Colossians that they ought to let the word of Christ dwell in them. And what is this word of Christ? The word of Christ is the message about Jesus, the gospel. The the message that God through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, is in the business of saving sinners. So if you are here among us today, and you are aware of the sin within, you are in a good place. We are aware of the sin within. We too recognize that sin is within. But we are not here to embrace it. But we are here to fight it. And we can do that together. The word of Christ is to dwell among us. Dwell. Do you see that word? Dwell. It's interesting that the word dwell here is the same word that the New Testament writers used to talk about our relationship with the Holy Spirit. In the the letter of the Ephesians 5.18... Paul says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled, that's the same word, right? That's that's the translation of the same word. But be filled with the Spirit. The way a Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit ought to be the same way that the gathering of believers is filled with the Word of Christ. The Word of Christ ought to be at home, at church, just like the Spirit is at home in the hearts of the believers. Now, look at the words, in you. You see that? Let the word of Christ dwell in you. If you're in Kentucky, this would read like this. Let the word of Christ dwell in y'all. Okay? So it's a plural. It's not talking about the individual. It's talking about 
the gathering of believers, the corporate service, Sunday morning, the very thing that we're doing right now. I'm certain that if we were to enter the average evangelical church in America any given Sunday, would likely find churches that view the Word of God as a hindrance to their ministry. Recently, a prominent evangelical pastor in Atlanta has written a book and said, first century church leaders unhitched the church from the worldview, value system, and regulations of the Jewish scriptures. Peter, James, Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from their Jewish scriptures. And my friends, we must as well. Friends, we need to be aware of doctrines from demons. This is not from God. As a matter of fact, this is the opposite of what Paul is saying here. The whole Bible is the word of Christ. Jesus would affirm that the Old and New Testaments attest to him. They are about him. And our churches and services must be filled richly with the word of Christ. You see, it's, it, it, the, the word of Christ ought to dwell richly among us. So it's not just we read scripture, we put a check mark, mark in a box, and we move on. No, it is the word of Christ that builds the church. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of Christ. Friends, don't be deceived by attractive personalities that will distort the truth and lead you astray. There should be no confusion when someone walks into Sheridan Hills Baptist Church any given Sunday morning. We are people of the book. We believe the book. You can feel this out. Scripture ought to shape our service. And Scripture ought to saturate our service. In 2016, the Miami Heat won the NBA championship. Do you guys remember that? Yeah? That's right. No, you don't remember. You're too young. Right? So do you remember Gary Payton? So if you remember Gary Payton, you can, you can claim true Heat fan, right? Because uh, the, the 2012 bandwagoners are not going to remember Gary Payton right? So, so the Heat won. Man, what great excitement. You see, and, and, and 8th Street, Calle Ocho, right? Right there in the heart of where Miami likes to celebrate all its victories. Uh, Indy and I used to live only three blocks away from it. You see, all the noises of the people walking around with their pots and pans and wooden spoons, they were everywhere where we lived. So guess what Indy and I did? And we have pictures to prove. I'm not going to show it to you. Guess what India and I did? We took our pots and pans and we joined the fun because it was so contagious. The excitement was so great. You see, when we truly believe the word of God, when we submit ourselves to the word of God, and when we're flourishing as we live out the word of God, that is contagious. People ought to look at that and say, I want that in my life. I'm going to grab my pots and pans and my wooden spoons, and I'm going to make noise with these people. Right? Friends, we ought to be excited about God's word in the life of the church. But remember, in this sermon, I'm arguing that this does not happen overnight, but gradually. So how, how do we cultivate an excitement for God's word. Let me give you three, just three helpful applications here. Read the word every day. If you have a choice to either eat or read, read. Man does not live of, of bread alone. So if you've had a meal today, you should have read scripture. Now I think if we're organized and if we're disciplined, we can do both, right? But the Word of God is more important to you than breakfast. 
If the word of God is more important to you than breakfast, you will look forward to the ministry of the word every Sunday morning. You find yourself bored with the word, with the explanation of the word, with the reading of the word, with the praying, the singing of the word. Spend more time in the word. Here's another, here's another uh, advice. Befriend people who know the word. Be around people who are talking about the word constantly. Let their wisdom penetrate your lives. Be surrounded by people who can't stop talking about Jesus. And then thirdly, be an active listener of the word. So when we're speaking, right, when we're reading the word, listen attentively. The word is to be read. Do not forsake the public reading of Scripture. But the word that is to be read is a word that is also to be heard. Whenever the word is read, both the reader and the listener are active parts in that event. Paul says that our services ought to be filled with the word, right? Now he's going to tell us how we ought to pursue that. Still in verse 16, he says, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Three things he highlights here at first, right? Teaching, admonishing, and wisdom. I think the teaching and admonishing are a couplet here. They go together. They, they are two sides of a coin. You can feel this in. Teaching is instructive and admonishing is corrective. Both things ought to be happening in the life of the church. The Christian life is like a road filled with tempting detours. We, we know so often that what we ought to do, but we don't do it, right? We, we know we ought to pray, but we often engage in social media instead. We know that we ought to be generous, but instead we hoard. We know that we ought to make time for people, but instead we, we clutter our schedules. We need one another's eyes in our lives, teaching and instructing us. You can feel this in. The local church is the place where we both teach one another we, what we ought to do and correct one another when we don't do what we ought to do. And maybe you can add to the side, or when we do what we ought not to do. That ought to be happening in the life of the church. I wonder if you've ever realized that this is a command to all believers. Friends, don't, don't think that it is the job of the pastors alone to teach and admonish. This word is to the congregation. Don't expect the pastors to be the ones getting involved with, in people's lives only. A covenant body of believers has no room for spectators. Friends, the job of the pastor is to equip the saints, that is you, to do the work of teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom. You notice that? With wisdom. So as we teach and admonish one another, it is not according to our preferences, but as the Word of God, as the Word of Christ dwells richly among us, we teach and instruct one another in all wisdom. In other words, we point one another to Christ. Have you ever walked by a job site and saw one guy working and three inspecting? Right? <laughs> something new tells you there's something wrong with this picture. Right? And there is. And churches could easily become that. A couple of guys working and a bunch of people watching. But you see... That is why I am instructing you right now and admonishing you today so that won't happen at Sheridan Hills. Friends, take advantage of our gatherings. Show up early and leave late. I love people who close the church. Engage in your community groups. Engage in your growth groups. When your community group leader calls you or texts you, here, here's a great idea. Answer. 
How about that? Ask, how can I help? Ask, does anybody need a ride? Connect over email. Connect with social media. Get to know people in the life of the church so that you can be obedient to God. Do you realize that? We, when we call you to engage in the life of the church, we're not asking you for a favor. You're not doing the pastors a favor. When we ask you to engage in the life of the church, we are calling you to faithfulness. It's different. We're helping you not be disobedient to God in sin. God calls us not to neglect the fellowship of believers. Because if we do, how can we teach and admonish one another? And how can we be taught and admonished? Now, friends, as we continue in the text, Paul takes us to a little bit of a surprising place. He has been telling us about teaching and admonishing and wisdom. And we might expect them here, him here to now talk about the preaching of the word. Right? The preaching is when we're taught and admonished. But instead, he mentions psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's kind of surprising, isn't it? But you can feel this in here. But Paul is here making a connection between doxology and discipleship. You know those words? Doxology is the worship of the church and discipleship or discipling is the teaching of the church. For Paul, there is an inseparable link between these two. As a matter of fact, I actually think that the rendering of the NIV lets us see this better. Look at what the NIV, look at how the NIV renders this verse. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. You see, here, the singing is connected with the attitude of the heart. And the psalms and hymns and the spiritual songs are connected with the teaching and the admonishing with one another. Now, it is not to say here that singing has nothing to do with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But Paul is emphasizing here the content of what we sing. The content of what we sing is how we teach and admonish one another. The singing is part of it, but you can feel this in. Singing without substance is nothing but an appeal to emotionalism. But Paul is telling us, sing with substance, because through your singing, you will teach and admonish one another. This is why we sing the songs that we sing. We look primarily for content and not for style. Our concern is that the lyrics we'll sing will be lyrics that will disciple you. We hope that the songs we sing can be sung a cappella around a hospital bed. That they can stimulate the minds and encourage the hearts of the believers and not simply tickle emotions. So Paul is saying here that the content, that the corporate singing is part of the mutual ministry of discipleship. So, so hear me out. The most loving thing that you can do when the church gathers to sing is to sing. That is how we love one another. Corporate singing is not a time for you to get into a little bubble, trying to, trying to experience emotions through song. But, but corporate singing is, is when we sing the gospel to one another. We're reminding one another of the gospel. We look at each other and we remind one another that we are sinners saved by a gracious God. 
You may be wondering here if there is any relevance to this list that Paul gives us, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I think so, but I don't think here Paul is saying that these are specific styles of music that should dictate everything we sing at church. I think what Paul is saying here is that worship ought to be diverse in style. A dead theologian once taught me this. Worship is not about preference. Worship is about reverence. Worship is not about preference, but worship is about reverence. So can you sing it reverently? If the answer is yes, then sing. Do you know what my goal, one of my goals is when I'm choosing the songs for Sunday morning? Here, here's one of my goals. I want to make everybody a little uncomfortable. I want everybody to be slightly uncomfortable with the style. I, I want someone's preference to be in one song and someone else's preference to be in another song. I want... I don't want anyone to be fully comfortable because that would not be serving to the body as a whole. It's funny that sometimes, sometimes I might have a conversation with someone and might tell me, man, the, the music here at Sheridan Hills is, is very traditional. And then I turn around and the next conversation is someone saying, man, the music here is really contemporary. And when that happens, I say, mission accomplished. Great. That's exactly what I want. I want you to prefer the style of your neighbor. I want you to say, I want to sing the songs that will encourage you. That is what it means to prefer one another. Now look at the last clause in verse 16. With thankfulness in our hearts to God. We worship with thankfulness in our hearts to God. That is true Worship. Now you see, that's why this passage is so relevant for this season. True worship is done with thankfulness in the heart to God. Notice that thankfulness ought to be genuine and ought, it ought to be also goal oriented. You could actually say God oriented. You see, a few years ago, I realized that there was something wrong with my heart when it came to congregational singing. Because I started leading music at church very young. And I would go to conferences, and when I was in leading the music, I just couldn't sing them. I had no motivation in my heart to sing the songs. I was disillusioned with congregational singing. I had become convinced that music at church had to sound like a concert and the lyrics had to always be happy and uplifting. When I went off to seminary, I said, I am done with congregational singing. Someone else will do that. I'm going to preach. Because I felt like I could preach and be genuine and be truthful. But I felt like I couldn't do that with congregational singing. But one time I was at chapel and we were singing in Christ alone. And when I came across the lyrics and on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Something happened. I was deeply moved. Once again, I couldn't sing those lyrics but for a different reason now. Because my voice was choking up because I was so deeply moved by that. You see, the word of Christ was moving my heart. I was thankful for the cross of Christ. You see, I had believed that mu music shouldn't be deep. I had believed the lie that music should just be light. Just get the people excited. The problem was that music wasn't from the heart. I wasn't always excited and ready to run to God and hug God and kiss God. That wasn't always true of me. Sometimes I was grieved and sad. Sometimes I was fighting in dwelling sin. Yeah. 
But you know what is always true? It is always true that Jesus died for me. Whether I'm sad or happy, whether I am in the middle of the fights or experiencing victory, it is always true that Jesus died for me. So I can sing that what, whether I'm depressed or excited. It is always true that my sins are nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. So when I realized that what was missing in worship was the word of Christ, I was able to worship him from the heart. Thankfulness in the heart, you can feel this in, means genuine thankfulness. Genuine thankfulness. Not lip service, but true thankfulness. And, and why should we be thankful? Because, because the word of Christ dwells among us richly. Because we know Christ and we know him crucified. And the goal of thankfulness is God. In the next few days, you're going to hear a lot of people saying that they're thankful. But they're not going to tell you whom they are thankful to. Thankfulness must have a goal. And the goal of thankfulness is God. To him we render thanks. Why? Look at James 1.17. Because every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Everything we have has been given to us by God. Children. We have a lot of children here, right? What a blessing to have our Fourth and fifth graders among us? Do you have food? Do you have clothes? Do you have a home? Do you have toys? Have you ever thanked the Lord for that? Why don't you take the time today to thank the Lord for the provision that he has made to you through your parents? Tell your parents thanks as well. Young men and young ladies, do you think that you change your own diapers when you're babies? <laughs> do you know someone else did that for you? You know who did that? Your parents. You know that when you were little, there was no app for that, right? And there's still no app for that, unfortunately. So I'm praying that in the next two months, somebody will come up with an app for that. Why don't you take the time today to thank the Lord for the provision that he has made for you throughout the years through your parents. And thank your parents as well. Friends, do you remember that it is the Lord's mercy, mercies that sustain you every day? If they weren't there, you wouldn't wake up. Do you remember that if you are able to work, it is the it is God who enables you to work. Do you realize that even your love for God is only possible because he loved you first? Have you thanked the Lord for that? Do you thank the Lord for that? From pack and place to playstations, from food to friends, from great joy to good jokes, from godly sorrow that leads to repentance, to hard providence. It is the Lord who supplies all our needs. True worship recognizes that and teaches the heart to be thankful. Now, friends, if you're not a Christian and you're among us today, we're so glad you're here. You are in the right place. There couldn't be a better place for you to be this morning. And we want to help you have a truly thankful Thanksgiving this week. Friends, because you may have all the goods of this world. You may have more goods in this world than all of us. But if you don't have Christ, you will one day leave them all behind. The Bible tells us that if we believe in Christ, we can have an eternal inheritance. Eternal life in heaven 
forever. Yet, friend, I'm afraid that, that if you were to die without Christ, it is not eternal bliss that you would experience. I'm afraid to tell you that you would instead experience eternal punishment. You see, we all have sinned against an eternal righteous God, and, and the punishment for our sin must match our crime. But friend, God has given us a message of reconciliation. We are all at a point enemies of God, enemies of the cross. But God has taught us that His Son, Jesus Christ, came and died in our place. So eternal condemnation is no longer our destination because He bore our sin. He bore our punishment. And you can't to escape from the punishment and the condemnation to come if you recognize your sin and if you run to Christ. If you're here among us and this message is resonating with you in your hearts, I would love to talk to you at the end of the service. Myself and other pastors will be back there in the pastor's reception. The, the, the Morgado family will be on this corner. Come talk to them. The Chipman family will be on this corner. And chances are, if you just reach out across the aisle to someone sitting next to you, they might help you understand what the gospel is and how you can respond to that. Don't go today without having that conversation. All right, so I told you my first point was really long, right? Yeah, it's over. All right, let's go to point number two now. It's going to be much shorter. Point number two, we cultivate thankful, thankful hearts towards God by worshiping Him with our entire lives. Verse 17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now Paul zooms out, right? And he zooms out from, from the corporate worship life of the church to the life of the local church as a whole. And whatever you do, this is one of the most encompassing statements in the Bible. The you here is still y'all, okay? So we're still in the plural. But now he's talking about the church in a broader context. Here's what he's saying. You can fill this in. The Christian life is not a compartmentalized life. It's not a life that we can live some days in Christianity and some days in secularism. Several years ago, I had a student. See, I, I, I used to teach private music lessons. Several years ago, I had a student, uh, and, and this student was, was very charismatic. Very charismatic young little boy, and, uh, and, but he wouldn't practice, you see. So I went to his mom, and I talked to her, and I said, hey, you know, your son is not practicing. You're wasting your money. Um, but she said, look, I know him. He's not going to practice. I just want him to be around you. Just have fun with him. And, oh, I can't tell you how much I wanted to drop that student right there and then. <laughs> but I needed the money. So I put myself through it. Every time I would go teach this student, I felt like he didn't practice, but I was the one being punished. It was tough. You see, at the end of the semester, the student had, had to play one piece for the end of the, on the end of the year recital. And that kid didn't even know Mary had a little lamb. What do you do? It was disastrous. At the end of the day, I played Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and he pretended, okay? Hey, sorry, honest moment of confession here, all right? Sometimes you got to do what you got to do, right? So, <laughs> you see what the problem was here? They thought that music was this nice little skill that you can pay for, get a few private lessons in, and put it in your basket of abilities, but that's not how music works. Music is hard work. Music involves private lessons often, yes. 
But music also involves sweat and tears at home. Likewise, the Christian life is not something that you can go to once a week and you can put, you know, put in your cart and drive away with it or, or, or put a check mark next to your good works list. No, friends, God is not satisfied with a portion of our lives. He, he wants you when you are at church. He wants you when you are at work. He wants you when you are at home. He wants you when you are with your family, with your friends. He doesn't want 10% of your checkbook and one day out of your week. He wants it all. He wants your possessions, your calendar, your strength. He wants your mind. He wants your heart. He wants it all. And unless you give it all to him, you will have nothing from him. He says, whatever you do in word or in deed, this involves what we say and what we do. I think what Paul is doing here is he's taking an expression and he's saying the whole spectrum. Whether you speak it or whether you act it. The whole spectrum. Whatever you do in word or in deed. Christian, talk the talk and walk the walk. When? Always. When Paul says in word, you can fill this in, he's referring to both the manner and the content of our speech. Our speech must be always gracious in manner, seasoned with salt. We can't go off on the waiter because our food is late. You're not allowed to do that as a Christian. We can't curse at the driver that cut us off. You're not allowed to do that as a Christian. It is not our name that we stain when we do that. It is the name of Christ because we do everything in the name of Christ. But our speech must be seasoned with salt. And our speech, our speech must be also filled with the message of hope. That is the message of Christ. Do you share the gospel with others? Do your co-workers know you're a Christian? Do you encourage believers with the word of God? When you speak, is it the wisdom of God that is spoken? Now when Paul says, indeed, indeed, he's referring to both what we do and how we do it. Both matter. Then he goes on to remind us, do everything in the name of the Lord. Jesus, we are ambassadors. We represent the high king of heaven. Now look at the last clause in verse 17. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. How do we live honoring Jesus' name? We do everything with an attitude of thankfulness to God. Why? I told you to hold on to this sentence from the beginning, right? Because when the gift meets the need, we often respond with thankfulness. Has the gift of God met your need? It has, hasn't it? So friends, be thankful to God. God gave us Christ so we could go from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And how should we respond with thanksgiving? Before we finish, look at the last two words in verse 17. Through Him. That is through Christ. Friends, the only way we can be thankful to God is through Christ. We are united with Christ by faith, so we have access to the Father. No one comes to the Father but through Christ. We have this table before us today. In the church, historically, especially the more liturgical traditions of the church, has for centuries called this the Eucharist. Right? The Eucharist comes from the word to give thanks. 
when Jesus took the cup, when he took the bread, he gave thanks. That was the last Passover meal. Because Paul says that today, Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. Friends, we take this meal as the true Thanksgiving meal. This is our Thanksgiving meal. We can only give thanks on Thursday if today we're thankful for the body of Christ that was crushed for us under the wrath of God and if we give thanks for the, for the blood of Christ that was spilled for us as a sign of the new covenant that we have with God. So are you approaching this table with thanksgiving? It is the thanksgiving of today that will make the thanksgiving of Thursday true. Let's pray together.